Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries across the state. Uh, we broadcast the show um, actually across the country. We have, we have people from outside the state. <laughs> we broadcast this show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. But if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's okay. You can always watch on um, the archive of our recordings at your convenience. And I will show you at the end of today's show where you can go on our website to see all of our archives. Um, both the live show and the archived recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone who you think may be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. Um, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for all libraries in, in Nebraska. So you will find things on our um, upcoming shows and on our archives for every type of library you can think of. Uh, public, academic, K-12, uh, universities, uh, correction facilities, museums, anything that has anything that is a library or can be considered library, um, we will have some do something on the show. And that is really our only criteria here that anything that we do have on is something library related, something libraries are doing, something we think they could be doing, uh, services and programs and resources that we think may be beneficial to them. Um, we do book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, demos of services and products. Um, we bring in guest speakers sometime from outside the Nebraska Library Commission to share what they are doing at their libraries. Uh, so we have some of those as well. But we also have uh, commission staff do sessions. And that was what we have this morning. With me this morning is Sam Shaw. Good morning, Sam. Good morning. And he is our planning and data services coordinator, our stats guy. <laughs> Yeah, David yeah, Gooch. <laughs> um, here at the Nebraska Library Commission, handling anything, handling anything statistics related for us, and he specifically is in charge for us the uh, the um, annual public library survey that is done, mm -hmm. and he is going to tell us today about how to do that and any new things coming up with it. I think there's some changes. Mm -hmm. usually. There are. Yeah. So I'll just hand it over to you, Sam, to take it away. Thank you, Krista. So. Um, the topic of discussion today is the annual public library survey and um, I'm going to go right here mm -hmm. and uh, so it's kind of a two-part we'll talk about a two-part thing today um, we'll talk about the public library survey in general first and then we'll also talk about bibliostat I just want to clear up some confusion at the outset mm -hmm. I hear people a lot of the time refer to this survey as the bibliostat survey mm -hmm. and that's not actually correct it's the public library survey. Bibliostat is the vendor that we use to collect the data um, in, in Nebraska. And so um, there may be other states that use a different vendor. Um, so the terminology, the correct terminology would be uh, the public library survey, but the, the, the vendor that we use to collect the data and the online tool is called Bibliostat. So, I didn't know. I thought that everybody had used Bibliostat. No, uh, oh, there's a okay. competing product called Counting Opinions is the other major vendor that oh, most states okay. use. And then there are some states that have their own homegrown versions. Oh. And some state, uh, some U.S. territories, like for instance, um, Guam and American Samoa, that have a very limited number of libraries, so they sure. use their own. Yeah. Um, okay. They only have like one one library that reports like I think in American Samoa, so they use Excel. Uh, whatever so, works. I guess yeah. if you can get the right numbers that you said this is it's something. Cheap. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but and so this is actually IMLS is the one who is asking for this data or who we're Correct. sending it on yeah. to. So as long as you can get the right data that they need, it doesn't <clears throat> matter how you get it. Right. Yeah. So so yeah, this is a part of a national um, statistical collection program from IMLS. Um, so in Nebraska, um, the report covers the library fiscal year. So for most people, this is either October 1 through September 30th or June or July 1 through June 30th. Um, we have a few states that have calendar year um, fiscal years, mm -hmm. so like January through December. Mm -hmm. So that just depends on your local, what your local fiscal year is. Um, so for the current survey that we are in the process of collecting data right now, um, runs November 5th, 2018, so it's open, Bibliostat is right. open and ready for um, you to input your data. And it'll stay open until February 15th of 2019. 
Um, that's the window that you can enter your data online with Bibliostat. Mm -hmm. And you will, you will enter the data, your statistics will cover your fiscal year. So whatever your fiscal year is, that either October 1 through September 30th or July 1 through June 30th. So you don't um, have to change your year to be anything in particular. It's whatever you guys do, whatever they do at their own library is correct, fine. Yeah. This, like, for yeah. instance, the state fiscal year is July 1 through June 30th. Mm -hmm. The federal fiscal year, I believe, is October 1 through September 30th. Right. So those are the more common ones just because it coincides with state or federal. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, this is a part of a national program um, by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Um, so we participate, um, all states participate in this program. Um, we're one of the um, states, like I said, that use Bibliostat. Um, so we'll cover Bibliostat later in this um, presentation. Mm -hmm. But um, I'd like to talk a little bit about IMLS. I think most of you are probably familiar with IMLS, but maybe some aren't. Um, I know Krista works with IMLS a lot too, so if you have mm -hmm. anything to add, jump in. So IMLS, um, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, is an independent agency of the U.S. federal government. Um, they're the primary source of federal support for libraries and museums throughout the United States and U.S. territories. Mm -hmm. um, that's financial um, and other support that they might give. Um, there's grants that are given by IMLS. That's a major um, mm -hmm. component. Grants National, to states, yeah. Grants to states programs. Um, so like that's a chunk of money that we receive as the State Library Administrative Agency from IMLS to then distribute. Um, national Leadership Grants um, are grants that they offer libraries throughout the United States. A lot of you have maybe heard of those. Um, but they also conduct as a part of those programs and a part of the money that they get from Congress, um, they also conduct policy research analysis and data collection. The primary um, method of data collection that they utilize is the annual public library survey. So, so like I said, they collaborate with state library administrative agencies, or SLAWS, <laughs> if you're into <laughs> acronyms, um, which the Nebraska Library Commission is. Um, they've published public library survey data since 1988. Okay. So. Um, we have a, a data file that goes back to 1988, um, and there's a, a series of, of uh, checks, edit checks, I guess you could say, that are employed when we submit our data to them that um, tries to ensure that the data that's submitted is reliable and complete mm -hmm. and also accurate. Um, so a lot of you that have done the survey before on Bibliostat, you, you will get edit checks uh, if your data is outside of a certain range, and we'll go over that a little later as we look at the new Bibliostat. Um, but that's the reason those edit checks are in place, is to make sure that uh, that the data is, is accurate uh, and complete. And so IMLS um, reports this data online. They're usually about a year behind, so you, we usually sure. report our data um, because different states have different data collection cycles. We're, I think, in cycle two. There's also cycle one that if you're in another state, you might be collecting data in the summertime. Mm -hmm. um, so usually when IMLS reports their data, it's usually like we report our data uh, usually early spring or late spring, early summer um, of the year. So the most current data that we have on our website is for the 2017 fiscal year, which was reported last um, <coughs> early summer. IMLS. The most current data on IMLS's uh, site is from 2000, uh, fiscal year 2016. Mm, so ours so is they're nice. usually about a year behind because they publish everyone's data at the same time. And they got to wait for everyone they to gotta get wait for everyone yeah. to submit. Um, so like I said, there's two groups. The states are divided into those two groups. And then for some reason, Texas, because it's so huge, uh, they, they're in their own group. So <laughs> okay. Texas, I can't remember how many administrative entities Texas has, but it's a lot. Mm, yeah. So IMLS does <clears> this. They do a public library survey. They don't do anything for any, they don't do any other surveys for other types of libraries, or I mean, they are the museum and libraries do these one for not, to museums as well. Not that I know, really of, not that I know, of, but that's a good question. Huh. Um, I, I don't know if they collect data from museums. I don't think mm -hmm. it's part of an annual cycle of collection mm -hmm. like with the public library survey. But that's a good question. I'd mm -hmm. have to look into that and, and see mm -hmm. what. Um, 
what data they analyze to to look at museum trends or yeah. or, or yeah. non-public library trends. Right. Um, I'm sure that they have things, but I don't know if it's part of this formal mm -hmm. data collection that we use for public library survey. Mm -hmm. So like I said, when you submit your statistics in Nebraska, um, it contributes to this national file, which is the IMLS data, IMLS data catalog. That's where they publish their data. Um, so like in Nebraska, this is kind of like um, what we use the data for in Nebraska. Uh, we use it for accreditation, the accreditation mm -hmm. process, if your library is accredited. Uh, some of you have been through that process, you'll notice that um, a lot of the data that you submit on your public library survey is pre-filled on your accreditation application. Yeah. Um, that's used to compare you to other libraries. So if you submit your statistics and the other libraries submit their statistics, then we have data that we can compare those benchmarks that are on the accreditation application. Um, actually, there's a Nebraska statute, which is 51-407, that requires us as the State Library Administrative Agency to collect an annual report mm -hmm. from all public libraries in the state. So we can say that submitting an annual report is required by statute. Um, and do we then consider the public library survey as the annual that's what report? We consider the annual Libraries, report. I don't want yeah. anyone to think, yeah. oh wait, that's now it. I have no, to send something else to you guys. Um, there's another <laughs> no. there's another statute that I think requires an annual report to the library board for public library. Right. Survey. Yeah. That's a separate. Yeah. Um, that's, a separate that's a separate report. And that's but just internal that, to your. The city, one to submit to us as the the state library administrative agency uh, is the public library survey. Once you've done that, you're good. Once yeah. you've done that, okay. you're good. And there's no penalty in the statute, so I'm not sure how yeah. much leverage. <laughs> it just says that we are to collect, so yeah. so that's kind of part of this program. This is how we do it, to. yeah. Um, so as a part of the accreditation application, submitting your statistics, uh, since that's required for the accreditation, it's also required to receive state aid. Mm -hmm. um, you must be accredited library to receive state aid. We also have a dollars for data grants program. Um, what that is, if you're not familiar with it, is we offer a $200 uh, dollars for data grant to libraries that are unaccredited that mm -hmm. submit their statistics online uh, with the Bibliostat program. Um, so maybe if you are looking to become accredited, that's the first step to become accredited is that you need to submit your statistics. And so, um, as a part of that, we offer a two hundred dollar incentive to to mm -hmm. to start Just to the at least process. start this. Yeah. And there are mm -hmm. some libraries that um, that maybe you know want to submit their statistics, but they're not really to that point of accreditation right now. That's a mm -hmm. good first step to submit your statistics. Mm -hmm. Maybe look at your peer libraries. Um, yeah, because once you and do then also receive the two hundred dollars. Yeah, once you do submit your statistics you are then invited to participate, to become accredited if you want to. That's the first step. You'll get an email from me in um, May, yeah, in the spring, after the statistics have been, as, as Sam said, they get, you know, everything's, the deadline is February, so by May, mm -hmm. June, we have all your numbers figured out and all the edits or fixes or whatever oh, errors <laughs> need to be fixed on. And then um, you'll be invited to apply to be accredited if you want to. Um, of course, everyone who is previously accredited and it's their up for reaccreditation will be told, hey, you're up. But people who have never been accredited, libraries will get the email as well saying, hey, since you did this, you can now become um, accredited. Now, even if you are not ready, as Sam said, to do everything involved with it, I highly recommend you at least go in and look at the application that's sure. been created for you because you can see where you're falling in relation to your peer libraries. We compare you mm -hmm. to, um, there's a few, a bunch of questions within the accreditation form that are um, comparing you to libraries who are within 15%? 15% of the legal service area. Yeah, legal mm -hmm. service area above and below your library, your library in the middle. So you can see for um, air, towns that are similar size to you, how you compare to them with some of these questions. So it's a good start to see, you know, where you are with that and see where places, areas you might um, want to think about improving and working on. Mm -hmm. um, and and, I, will, yeah. I will say one thing that um, when you log into your, your accreditation application for those benchmarks that are those questions on the accreditation application, it'll give you the, it'll give you what your numbers are and then your, right. the peer average and the peer median 
And if you want to look at the backend data, the more specific numbers from all of those libraries to see how you compare to specific mm -hmm. um, libraries with the same or similar legal service area, you can always email me and I'll pull those, pull that data mm -hmm. for you and send it. Yeah. Um, which can be helpful too. Um, you know, if you want to look at more detailed, um, the more detailed data. Mm -hmm. Because it's only some of the questions that we use in accreditation. It's not going to be everything. Mm -hmm. um, and Sam can pull everything for you and or, customize or, yeah, whatever customize, you want to know. Customize yeah. our full what data that's published know. on our site. Yeah. Someone did let us know um, this, the statute for reporting to your city or village, if anyone's interested in this, is <laughs> statute 51-213, 213. All right. So. <laughs> Excellent. So like I said, we use Bibliostat. And, um, Part of the reason that we are doing this today is that we have a new version of Bibliostat um, that just came out this year. And so for those of you that have used the old Bibliostat, um, part of the issue with, with the old version of Bibliostat is that Chrome was never supported. Oh. And so with the new version, Chrome is now one of the supported browsers. Um, so that's um, a plus, although, um, with the new version of Bibliostat, um, since we're one of the early libraries to, to use it, um, we want your feedback. Um, how, did, how did it compare to the old version? Were there challenges that you, that you when you used it? Um, mm -hmm. So if, if, if any of those things come up, um, send me an email or give me a call so that I can then pass that on back to Bibliostat and let them know. Um, so your username and password um, you have one password that you log into your accreditation application. That same username and password is the same username and password that you use for Bibliostat. Mm -hmm. It's the same same thing. And then we also we'll talk about later the NLC supplemental survey. That's also the same password. So, so I want to make have, you have to remember you have another one password one. <laughs> for for all three <laughs> for all three things. Um, so here's some links. Um, you can also get to these from our website. The, the first link up at the top is the um, the uh, the main page for Bibliostat, which will contain up at the top a, a, a link, a direct link to that URL that's the second link on this page, which is your log to log into Bibliostat. Mm -hmm. It also contains, um, if you want to print a paper version of the survey and maybe fill it out offline before you enter the data, you can do that. It's a PDF and Word, ver Word version you can use. Um, it also has instructions. Um, there's um, tips. There's an overdrive guide, although we pre-fill that data. If you're one of the Nebraska overdrive libraries, that data will be pre-filled on your survey. But if you want to know how we pulled that data, um, there's a guide on there that will show you how to do that. Um, so after you log into that main page from the direct URL, the second link there, um, you'll see all the surveys that you've submitted in previous years. So if you want to, if you ever want to log in and print those surveys, you can at any time. We also save a copy here at the commission locally. Um, I save a PDF of everybody's survey. So if you are having some issues logging in and getting um, your prior year surveys, you can always contact me and I'll send you the PDF of that. Um, if you've lost your ID and password, you can always send me an email or call. If I'm not around, you can call the reference desk, uh, the 800 number, mm -hmm. or there is a lost password um, link. So um, I think if you go to our website and type in lost password or um, Bibliostat lost password or something to that effect, you'll get that link down at the bottom. And you just mm -hmm. enter your library name and it'll automatically send uh, your password um, to the email of the director that's on file with us. Mm -hmm. Um, so, like, if you were working on this on the weekend and you couldn't get all the reference desk, couldn't get all of me because I'm not here on the weekends, yeah. you can always do that lost password. And I will, say one, I will say one thing about passwords, the number one issue that we get with passwords not working is most of our passwords are start with NE for Nebraska, mm -hmm. and then they have a series of numbers after it. Those numbers, um, the primary issue is that when people enter the, the zero as a capital O, um, uh, it creates yeah. an issue in Bibliostat and it's not, it, it, it yeah. doesn't recognize it as an O, or it doesn't recognize it as a zero, it recognizes it as a zero. It's supposed to be a zero. Yeah. O. So, there's no O's so in our password. There's no O's in the password. <laughs> it is a zero. Uh, I would say that's the number one, uh, number one issue that we have with logins. Mm -hmm is that it's uh, and, and then the password usually starts with P-A-S-S -S and then a series of numbers. Yep. 
So there's no O's at all in the ID or password. <laughs> now let everybody know while we're on this page too. Um, after, um, when you get the archive for today's show, the recording, we will have access to this PowerPoint as well. Um, we'll upload this to our SlideShare account. So don't worry about trying to scribble down these passwords or these URLs or anything. Um, you'll have this sent to you. As well. It'll be on the page with our recordings. Um, but also, as Sam said, this is all on our website as well, um, which we're going to demo that for you a little bit too, so you'll see it. Yeah, and that, that new um, direct URL to, to uh, collect, uh, Bibliostat Collect, and the reason that Baker and Taylor is in there, Baker and Taylor owns Bibliostat. I didn't know. And that. Baker and Taylor is now owned by Follett, so oh, <laughs> they're all under the umbrella of Follett is. now. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, that's why it's like that. There's something else. Okay, onward. So when you log into the new version of Collect, um, this is what it's going to look like. It's a little bit different than last year. Um, you'll notice up at the top, like this is the, the Ainsworth Public Library. You'll notice up at the top left corner, um, the library name, that'll be your library. Um, over to the right, you'll see survey list, and that would be a link to your prior year surveys. So if you want to look at um, the 2017 survey, the 2016, you'll, you can click on that link and you'll get a, a screen that'll uh, provide you with prior year surveys. Uh, frequently asked questions, we try and you know put those on there if things come up that are common, known issues. And the full survey instructions. So you'll notice as you navigate through the survey, certain questions will have instructions embedded within the survey itself. If you'd want to look at the entire instructions, you can look at those uh, by clicking on that link up at the upper right hand corner. Um, there's a save button to save the data that you entered on the page up in the at the top, uh, a submit button when you get when you get completed your survey and you're ready to submit it, you click on that button. A print icon if you'd want to print um, the survey before you submitted it, for instance. Um, over on the left, this is pretty important. There's a show status bar. Um, there that's important if you. Um, that's important. Um, after you've entered all your data, when you're done with your survey, you want to go to that. And you know, we talked a little bit earlier about edit checks. Mm -hmm. So the system will run through a series of edit checks. And if, if your data is, say, outside of a certain range, or it's exactly the same as what you entered last year, you might get an edit check for certain questions. So you want to look at that and see what edit checks you have. It'll also tell you if you have unanswered questions, um, required unanswered questions, and unrequired um, Unrequired unanswered questions. <laughs> so an edit um, check doesn't necessarily mean you did it, you answered it wrong. It's just correct. It it's means, setting up. It's set, it set up a little alarm saying, yeah. is your circulation, is your statistics really the same as last year? Yeah. Did your programs yeah. really remain the same? Yes. Yeah. And you just have, you did, have to enter sure. a note and say yes, they did. Yeah. Or another common edit check is for overdrive libraries. Everybody typically spends uh, or pays the commission five hundred dollars per year for the overdrive fee. Mm -hmm. Because that's reported the same every year, you, you typically get an edit check and it says, uh -huh. why is this the same? And you just have to enter a note in the note field saying, this is my overdrive fee and it hasn't changed. It always, year yeah. year. It's always yeah. the same. Um, so again, over on the left-hand side, you'll see survey navigation. You can go through different sections of the survey. It uh, starts with general data, library facility. A lot of those first two sections are going to be pre-filled because those are things that don't really change from year to year. Mm -hmm. um, Usually your address, phone number, those things remain the same. Although uh, sometimes you know we run into issues if you know people move, mm -hmm. we have to move, or a branch opens or things like that that are kind of uncommon but do happen from time to time. Section three is library finance. Section four is library collections. Section five is library services. Mm -hmm. uh, six is technology. I got my cheat sheet. Over here. <laughs> Six is uh, technology, seven staffing, and then we have some certification things towards the end. Um, one important thing here, let me see here, is over is this, mm -hmm. this button right here. Uh, so you may log in and this may say show last year's answers. Right now I have it set up to, uh, to automatically show last year's answers. That's mm -hmm. a very important thing that I use all the time that I think a lot of libraries use as well. 
you can either turn that on or off to show last year's answers or hide last year's answers. And I always like to look at what was entered last year. That way, you know, um, here it's going to show you what last year's answer was. Um, as you enter data, you kind of want the data to vary from year to year, but not be exactly the same. But you can then look at that and say, oh, my gosh, our data is way off. What from happened? What we had <laughs> last year. Yeah. But maybe it was entered incorrectly or we need to look at it again. Or maybe some event happened that you need to enter a note. Like, say you had um, a tornado hit and you were closed for six months out of the year. So yeah. that's why your data was outside of that range. And that would be the note that you would need to enter. Um, so you, you'll notice here that uh, some questions are pre-filled on your survey. We try and pre-fill as much as we can, although there's probably um, some other things that we're looking at that we might be able to try and pre-fill that we haven't pre-filled, like lender compensation mm -hmm. at a request for that. Um, probably won't happen this year, but that might be something that we might look at next year if we have that data. We could pre-fill it for you. That way you don't have to go through those reports. Um, and other things, if you know of something maybe that would be more helpful that we don't pre-fill, let me know and we'll try and pre-fill it. We'll try and make it as easy as we can. Um, you'll notice here, like on this question, there's a question mark. If you click on that, you'll get a pop-up that'll contain more information. It's so like in this case, there's a, a a definition of what we what's reported for mailing address um, and I think the definition says something like uh, if you have a PO box you report that there mm -hmm. not to report the street address but a PO box so if you didn't have a PO box you'd put an NA or leave a blank um, <clears throat> oops whoa ah. what happened there that was weird did I hit it uh -huh. twice well, that's more than twice. Did I hit the scroll bar? I, I hit that. Did I hit the scroll Maybe. bar? Maybe. Okay. All right, Gary. That's good. Okay. All right. So you'll, notice, you'll also notice um, <coughs> some of the fields are in gray. Um, like here, the first four questions are grayed out. Those are, those are pre-filled with data, and they can't be changed. And the reason that they can't be changed is if there's slight variations in that, when I go to submit all of our data to IMLS, it throws an edit check on our end. Um, so if, for instance, your telephone number has changed, um, or your zip code's changed, or your address has changed, or any of those things happen, let me know. And I can, I can as the survey administrator, make that change to those grade fields. And then we'll have to enter a note. We can enter a note saying, yeah, you moved to a new location. Um, and then there's other things that we need to do on our end when we submit the data to IMLS. Um, you'll notice also that some questions are in purple, like the first four are in purple. Oh, yeah. And the fax number is not in purple. What that means is that those purple questions are federally required questions. So uh, we have a meet, an annual meeting of all the data coordinators in December, it's actually next week, uh, where we look at all the data elements that are federally required questions. And um, people can propose new questions that, hey, this is an important question that maybe we should ask at the federal level. And so then um, if those are proposed, then each state has a vote. And if there's a certain number of votes, then that element, pat that data question passes and it becomes part of everyone's survey um, for all the states and U.S. territories. Questions that aren't in purple are questions that we ask at the state level. We can ask anything on this survey, so uh, those are questions that maybe we want to know um, that are important to us at, on the state level, like in this case your fax number. Um, at the bottom of each page, You'll see a navigation button that'll have uh, take you to the previous or take you to the next. If you click on next, it'll save the data that you entered on that page. So you, you, while you, while you could scroll all the way back up to the top and hit save and then navigate to the next, you don't have um, to. You don't have to because easier, it should yeah. save your it should save your data when you click on that next button. So let's talk about flagging a question. So why would you typically flag a question? Say you were entering your data and you noticed something that seemed a little off or you remembered something that you didn't include in the number and you didn't want to go and get it. You wanted to just flag the question so that you would 
you would know that um, there was some issue with that question that you needed to look at later. So you can flag that question, and then when you go to submit your survey, at the end, it'll say, hey, you've, you had two questions that you flagged, and uh, it'll alert you so that you can then look at those questions at the end. So this so, is kind of marking one, marking a question to look at later, yeah, go back so, to later. So, so, hey, I wanted to look at this because I forgot that I uh, needed to include this. Uh, I forgot to include the eclipse. Uh, in my program numbers, I forgot to include the eclipse event that we had at the library. That would be one mm -hmm. example. And then when you, and then you could go and you know track that number down and then, and then go back to your survey later and make sure that you hadn't entered. Um, you can either flag the question within the survey itself. That's the example number one at the top, or you can uh, flag it in the uh, look at the flagged questions in the status button. That's the, the the example at the bottom there. That's that show status um, that we talked about earlier. That's in the upper left hand corner. You can then look at your flagged questions, and when you go to the status, and that status bar will have those three things. It'll show your edit checks, it'll show your unanswered questions, and then your flagged questions. So you can look at all three there. So same thing with a note. You can enter a note um, in the survey itself, and or you can wait until the end and look at say, hey, you know, did I is this going to throw an edit check? Um, sometimes you may know that it's going to throw an edit check or believe that it's going to throw an edit check, like the overdrive is an example. Mm -hmm. If you've done the survey every year and you know that that's always an edit check, you can just enter a note in the survey itself and say, this is my overdrive fee, hasn't changed, it's the same as last year, it's $500. Or my programming stayed the same if you know that that throw, typically throws an edit check for you. You can enter it in the survey itself or you can enter it in the status when you get down towards the end. Um, you also have the option for notes. Um, there's the federal notes, so if you have a question that's in purple and that throws an edit check, you'll, you're going to want to enter a note in the federal mm -hmm. note field. That's this one down here. Mm -hmm. So you'll once you pull up this either in the survey itself or in the status, you have the option to enter a federal note, a state, lo state note, a local note, or what you entered for the previous year. Mm -hmm. So you can just copy and paste if you know that that's the same if it's thing, the that, same thing happens. that happens yeah. every year. Um, so state and local notes, um, you might want to enter a state or local note. Um, if it's a state question and maybe you want to explain something to us, maybe why your data was outside a certain range, but it's not a purple question or federal question, you can enter a state note and let us know. Or sometimes local notes are, are um, important or useful for library directors that maybe um, you might want to put in the survey itself, hey, here's where I got these numbers. Um, so that if, if something were to happen to you and somebody else looked at that, they would know where you pulled those numbers from. Mm -hmm. Or like if you forget, since you only do this once a year, <laughs> right? <laughs> you could then look at your local note and say, hey, this is where I got those. And, and that kind of is important, especially when we look at electronic materials. Um, you know, where those reports were ran, where they came from. Um, maybe your ILS has a certain report that you run for, for certain data. You could enter that in a local note. Um, so, like I said, this is also in this show status bar. Um, you can also then, like I said before, uh, once you get done with your survey, survey, you can click on that show status bar and it'll show you what edit checks you have. And you can then enter your, your notes for, for edit checks. It'll show your unanswered questions, make sure that you uh, fill those in. And if things are um, not applicable or they're zero, um, sometimes, especially for the federal questions, if it's something that doesn't really apply to you, make sure that you enter an NA or zero in those, um, just so that um, you'll be able to submit your survey. Otherwise, you won't be able to. Also, if there's so, things that require that you didn't, you just it left blank because it's it was not, not let applicable. You even hit it won't submit. let you submit the survey unless you put an NA put in there. It's in there. Not applicable. So here's what the screen looks like in the show status bar. So here's an example of of an edit check. Um, that showed up for the FSCS Public Library definition. Um, so, and you notice on the right-hand side, it explains to you why this is an edit, why this, is, why they're asking for more information. Um, it says your library is an FSCS library. You've entered yes, or uh, it shows up as yes, but you don't have any staff expenditures. So, one of the criteria for an FSCS library is that you have staff expenditures. So you either would need to look at your staff expenditures and say, well, was that misreported? 
or do we really have no staff expenditures this year? And if you did, then you would enter a federal note, um, you know, explaining that you didn't have any staff expenditures and why. Um, you would enter that in the federal note field down below. So then once you would enter a note, so like here's an example of an edit check where that came up on operating revenue um, as $950, and I assume that's because it was lower than what they had received the year before. Um, because it, if you notice on the, that edit check has now turned green because we've entered a note mm -hmm. down at the bottom that says we received less money, less revenue from the city this year. And uh, that then makes that edit check turn green and that means you're good to go. I would say one thing is that um, when you enter a note, try and make it more try and make it somewhat specific as to the reason why your data is out of the range. Um, if it's something that is outside the range that you verified, that that is the actual number of programs that you did have, you can enter a note saying something like, "I verified this number, and this is um, this this is truly the number of programs that we offer during the fiscal year." Um, if you enter a kind of a vague note. It's gonna. Um, the system will ask us for, or I will call you. <laughs> actually, I will call you and say, "Hey, can you provide more information about this?" Um, so try and enter as, mo as much of a specific note as you can, so that'll avoid follow-up later on or time spent following up later on. So again, with unanswered questions, when you go in the status but button, um, you'll notice up here at the top, there's a. A menu here for required unanswered questions and unrequired or, or unrequired unanswered questions. Um, so that would be like the required ones would be the ones that are in purple. And it's saying here, even though you had, you know, last year you reported zero for capital revenue, this year you left it blank. And so in this case, if you didn't have any capital revenue, you just need to enter a zero so here put zero in there. and answer it. And you can do that from this status bar here too. Um, if you had more than one required unanswered question, you can enter all those here and then down at the bottom um, hit, I think, save or submit. I think it's submit the answers to the unanswered questions. So you can do that right there. You don't need to go back, go back into the survey. Into the survey. So that's yeah. nice. So once you've resolved those edit checks and your unanswered questions, you can go ahead and click on the submit button if you're ready to submit. Mm -hmm. And I will say that once you've submitted, if you run into things that need to be changed later on, I can make those changes as the survey administrator. So yeah. if something comes up later on, it's not um, something that we can't undo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but once you, once you hit submit, you can't go back in. Once you hit submit, right. your survey is locked. And uh, what happens is, um, is I will get an email notification indicating that your survey has been submitted and that it's locked. And um, typically then I'll take a look at it and then follow up with, um, with an email if there's, um, if there's uh, issues that we need to resolve. Um, so once you, but once you submit it, um, yeah, you can't log back in and it's, it becomes locked. And like I said, edit checks and unanswered questions um, must be resolved before you can submit the survey. So it won't here, even allow you to click the button. So if yes, not. well, okay. so here, so here's here's an example of, of if you hit submit and you had issues. Um, so the first one says all required questions must be answered before a survey can be submitted. It's a you know this red sign. Mm -hmm. um, so and then it gives you a link to to where you can look at those unanswered questions. Um, to then enter zeros if there's something that was left out or something that wasn't entered correctly. If you have a flagged question, um, like here it's green because we don't have any flagged questions, but if you did have a flagged question, it would notify you that of that here. Um, and then it would also notify you if you have edit checks that maybe you didn't enter a note. Um, and for the federal questions, make sure that you've entered the note in the federal field because I think that the edit check will come up if it's in the state or local. You got to use federal. the right one for depending on what you're answering. Yeah. So what then you, you can, out. you know, you can resolve those again from this edit check status here. And like I said, once your survey is submitted, then I get an email and I'll go in and look over your survey, look over your notes and make sure everything looks good. Um, 
if you do need to make changes later on, um, let me know. And uh, you know, say you found some found something they didn't include, we can um, make changes to your survey during the data collection, uh, which runs until the middle of February. February. Um, typically, I will email you if I have questions. Um, and like I said, you can log back in any, any time after you've submitted a survey in print. If you'd want to um, print it for your own records, if you want to copy locally, you can do that at any time. So that's what I have for the public library survey. Are there any questions at this point or I will go on to the <coughs> supplemental survey. <coughs> if there's yeah, if questions, you, have any, you can type them yeah, in. If any questions, type them into your question section. Um, if you want to right now um, and just you know you can type them in at any time when we're talking you have to wait um, whenever you think of something you want to ask go ahead and type it and we'll sure, answer maybe, it as you maybe this is a good time to. to pull up the browser and show how to get to the bibliostat main page I find okay. that the easiest way for me is to um, just type in public library survey in the search box or bibliostat um, it'll also show up in the um, I think we have a link in the reminder section over here Right. During the survey cycle, so you can click on that, and it will, should take you to the uh, oh, it's absolutely the blog post. Mm -hmm. um, and then within that, you've got within yeah. that there's links to the training guide, um, lost password reset button, um, and a direct link to the survey. Um, let's go back here. So in this case, if we wanted to just type in bibliostat. That's going to take us to the um, that main page, which I talked about earlier, that has a direct link to the login, the blank survey. If you want to print it in PDF and do it locally or fill it in with the word and then enter it online later. If you want to look at maybe changes that we made from year to year, we also have a version of that. And this year, there's no, there were no changes to the. Um, we made no change. We made we didn't make any changes to the state questions. It was a change that now we have a new federally required question, and that was for website visits, mm -hmm. which we were asking at the state <clears> level, so it didn't affect us because we had been collecting that data already for the last two years. Um, a link to the instructions. Frequently asked questions about Bibliostat, um, maybe known issues um, with Bibliostat. There's also a link to the federal definitions. So if you'd want to look at how you know those federal questions that we talked about and how they how they define um, legal service area or how they define programs or how they define um, how they define the new Wi-Fi or the, the new um, website visits definition you can look at that there uh, Wi-Fi Wi-Fi visits stuff like that is all in the federal those are all federal questions you can look at those definitions here uh, public library survey guide that's the PowerPoint from today um, for new directors in particular and then here's that overdrive circulation guide that I was talking about mm -hmm. um, that we will pre-fill that data if you're a Nebraska overdrive library we pre-fill your holdings and your circulation but if you'd want to look at that um, how we how, how Devra pulled those numbers um, the guide is right there so let's talk about the supplemental go, here. Just, uh, no, go to the next one next from current slide uh, I'll let you go. oh it's all right Right there. Picks up right okay. yeah. So once you've submitted your survey and everything looks good and you get a thank you um, email from me, <laughs> we also have a NLC supplemental survey. So this is much easier than the public library, than the whole <laughs> public library survey. Um, so the reason that we have a supplemental survey is we like to keep track of, make sure that our records here are up to date with um, uh, your most current information. So like say your hours, your board members, um, I'm trying to think of what else we include on there. Contact information, uh, I think we keep, keep track of social media. Mm -hmm. If you have a Facebook link, we wanna make sure that we have the, the most up-to-date up one. Um, there's a series of questions on there that, um, that we ask um, that feeds into our website as well. So the information from the supplemental survey feeds into our website so that the, the information that's publicly available is to make sure that it's up to date. So you can do the supplemental survey at any time throughout the year, like say your staffing changed, 
or your Facebook link changed or your board members changed, you can log in at any time throughout the year and update that information. But we like to have you update it at least once a year. And so that's why we send you a, um, a reminder after the uh, after you submit your public library survey. And so that's a kind of a good time to think about it because you're, time to in, do it, you're yeah. doing survey type stuff anyways. Right, and it is required for your accreditation application too. So you want to make yes. sure that you do both. Um, we also have library maps. We want to make sure that those are up to date. Um, and, and other directories that are out there, mostly, mostly our website. Um, yeah, down at the bottom. Library staff, board, friends groups, hours, and online services. So if you have an OPAC, any of that changes, you can always log in. You can let us know, send us an email. We can update the information, but you can also do it yourself with the supplemental survey and it automatically updates our records. Um, so once we get the data, once we get all the public, uh, all the data from every library, <laughs> so kind of the process is that I take all these, um, all these surveys and submit them to IMLS in the spring. And they have a series of edit checks that they run through too, um, that maybe there might be follow-up questions that come up later that um, maybe they looked at one of our notes and said, hey, we want more information about this. So you may get a contact from me when that process happens, like in the spring. Um, usually, we're clean, usually I'm cleaning up a lot of the data um, after the survey cycle ends in mid-February and getting it ready to submit to IMLS. But once it's submitted to IMLS, they may have a follow-up question. So you may get a contact from me. It doesn't happen very often because usually we like to be proactive with entering notes in the surveys for known issues that come up on those edit checks. But it's possible that they might uh, ask a follow-up question and I would contact you and say, hey, can you provide more information about this? Um, so once our, once our data is submitted to them, um, we publish it on our website. Um, historical data is also on our website, so if you'd want to look at um, data from prior years, you could. Um, and this is a huge Excel file <laughs> um, that, uh, that you could download and you know, sort. Like, if you'd want to look at certain measures, you could sort. Mm -hmm. Say, hey, I want to know how I compare, how my internet speed compares to every other library in the state. So you can download that into an Excel file and and uh, and look at that data or any other question that we um, that we ask on the survey. Um, and like I said before, the completed data is then pre-filled on your accreditation application, um, so it shows up automatically. We also use it to identify the peer library groups mm -hmm. we talked earlier. And as we also talked earlier, IMLS would then release that data in the spring. Um, that might be helpful if, say, your library that um, is maybe a, in a metropolitan area where Nebraska has a lot of rural libraries. Mm -hmm. And say you, were in a, say you were in a location where you want to look at similar libraries, um, but you're not in a rural area, maybe you're in a um, suburban or metropolitan area, and there's not a lot of libraries in Nebraska to compare yourself to. Right. You need you to expand then, beyond You can then state, go to that yeah. data catalog and, 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 and look at library, similar similar libraries in other states if you wanted to and see how you compare. And that is what we've done for um, accreditation applications for um, for the peer libraries that we compare you to. We do have, we, we, are, you know, we know we have certain libraries in Nebraska that don't have anyone to be right. compared and we pull the numbers from um, really neighboring states to us because they That's have, right. we try to assume and from our same region, they possibly do things the same way as our libraries do. So it's the, they're more similar to to our libraries as far as they run things. But we need to find bring them in because um, we don't have any libraries your same size mm -hmm. to do the peer comparisons. And typically, it's Iowa libraries because Iowa right. is very yeah, similar to Nebraska. Similar to Nebraska. Yeah. So you might notice that some of your peers in the accreditation application. Um, are from Iowa, and that's the reason why mm -hmm. those those appears because there's not enough Nebraska peers to compare you to. Yeah. Um, one thing to keep in mind if you do go to that IMLS data catalog, that all that data is a year is a year old. So the data, if you want current mm -hmm. data, always get it from our website. Um, if you want to look at look at data that IMLS publishes from other states, um, that's available, but it's a year old. It's a year old. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, 
if you need help when you're doing your survey, you can always contact me. I'm always here to help you. Um, either call me, send me an email. I will be gone next week at the Data Coordinator Conference, That's weather okay. permitting. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you lost your password, you can always contact the, um, the reference desk, like I said, mm -hmm. if you lost password. I use that online um, feature we have. You can also contact Bibliostat if you run into like mm -hmm. a error code or something like that. I want to know about that, so let me know. Um, but you can also contact them. There's also a help button in Bibliostat where you can contact them. Um, and, and also on our website, like those guides, you know, might be helpful, you know, if you want to look at those definitions. Like I said, the little question mark next to the question, mm -hmm. if you want to know what to count where. Um, typically, we get a lot of questions about electronic stuff. Mm -hmm. Where do I put this? <laughs> Which category does it um, actually fall yeah, under? And I will yeah. say that the general rule, I mean, this is probably an oversimplification, but the general rule is um, for ebooks and audiobooks, if it is not permanently retained by the patron, uh, if it's quote unquote returned, you report that in the ebook audiobook section. Um, if it is permanently retained, we count that as a database or an electronic collection. Um, so that's kind of the general rule, and that's or or just let me know. Um, just call and say, hey, we have this vendor, this service. This is what it is. Where do I report it? Um, but typically, we get a lot of questions for for electronic stuff like that. Do I report it as a database or a, an electronic collection? We call it a database. I think the IMLS definition says it's an electronic collection. They got rid of the database mm -hmm. definition a few years ago. Um, so it's uh, it's defined, you know, with both terms. But you're gonna probably need some value. explanation of yeah. what, <laughs> yeah. Right. So if anybody has any questions right now, let us know. You can type it in. Did you want to do some a demo on, of the actual logging in? Yeah, we could. Um, right, if you hit escape, you'll be able to then click on your browser at the bottom there to bring it back up. Yeah. So to log into the survey, you're talking? So here, sure. you, this is the login. You would enter. I'm just going to enter the test module and see if I can get into it. So this is kind of like when you log in, this is what it's going to look like. It's going to show you this, this year's survey. You can look at the status. You could print. If it was already submitted and locked, you wouldn't have that continue button. You wouldn't be able to go into mm -hmm. it. You can also look at the prior years. Nice. Like here, there's a print icon. If you want to look at that and print it, you could. Um, 2017, going back to I don't know, 2001, mm -hmm. it looks like. That was probably when we started using Bibliostat, I'm guessing. Oh. Um, we have reports from prior to there. Like if you'd want to sure. look at your survey from um, a year before that, um, just contact me and I can track that down for you. Actually, we got a request from a library. I wanted to look at our annual report from early 1900s, and we had them. Wow. Um, there was only like one page <laughs> of data that was, was reported, there. but they, their holdings wow. and circulation and stuff were in there. So we have those on paper. You never <laughs> know what we have yeah, here, yeah. Um, and like um, someone I said, does have a quick question before you go on to uh, do this about when you're talking about the e-materials. Someone wants to know if you can repeat the difference between e-material retained versus returned. Okay, so like if you had an e-book um, that a patron checked out and it, there was a, a lending period, so say it was like 21 days, mm -hmm. and it it would disappear from their device or technically they would um, or they could go you know be, if they were finished with it before that time period they could go and return it to mm -hmm. the system so that somebody else could check it out like an, a great example of this would be overdrive mm -hmm. um, that's counted in the in section four on the survey in the library holdings so you would count your overdrive holdings and then you would count in section five for library services you would count it as an ebook circulation Sure. Um, okay. If it was like, I think Zinio would be an example of, say, um, uh, a magazine, an electronic magazine that's maybe permanently retained. I think Zinio is permanent. Mm -hmm. I think it's permanently mm -hmm. retained. Um, so if that was permanently retained by the patron, they don't return it. They don't it. have to return it. Yeah. Um, they just keep it. Uh, then that gets reported as a Zinio would get reported as a database, and then the number okay. of uses of Zinio would get reported on the survey. And I can okay. I can show you where that looks on the survey because um, that's kind of a little tricky. 
or it can be a little tricky because it's part of a repeating group, which we should probably go over too. Um, so here under library collections, um, it's going to ask about paper books. Uh, here's where you would report to ebooks. So this is a part of the OverDrive libraries. This would be pre-filled if you're an OverDrive library. If you do a Nebraska OverDrive library, this is going to be pre-filled based on your fiscal year. Um, if you had another shared collection, if you were part of another consortium, you would report those holdings there. Um, 4.7 is where you would report OverDrive Advantage titles. This is where you would report OverDrive Advantage titles or titles that were um, made available locally through your library or OverDrive Advantage Plus titles that are made available that you've purchased locally and then turned back over to the consortium or shared um, with the rest of the OverDrive Libraries group. So you report the holdings here and then same thing here for audiobooks. And then the circulations for those get reported under library services. And for the circulation, um, your overdrive circulations are going to be pre-filled. See here in notes, uh, pre-filled for overdrive circulations only. So if you have a different vendor, you're going to want to add that. You take add what's to in there and then take add. Take that in and yeah. add your, the rest of it. Yeah, and the circulations um, are for adult downloadable materials that includes overdrive ebooks and audiobooks. And they do separate out children's. And then children's so, yeah. down here for this. Okay, so that's where those children's would be reported. And I always tell people um, on the survey if you can't determine whether it was an adult item or a children's item, sometimes, you know, they may be cataloged different ways. I would just re report it under adult if you can't make that determination as to whether it's an adult or a children's. So for the data, for the material that's, um, here's electronic collections, which we would call databases. Uh, it gives you an, uh, kind of a longish definition mm -hmm. <laughs> here of what to count. Um, I said, do not have a circulation period. Do not yeah. have a circulation period and are permanently retained. That's kind of a general guideline that we use. Um, so like in this case, um, on this test survey, we've entered that they had three um, local electronic collections databases. So just to clarify, you don't report Nebraska access. Um, databases that are provided by us are reported in a different spot on the survey. This is only stuff that you purchase locally. So in this case, you would, if you had three, you would put a three or whatever number that you have. And then you would enter in 5.15, in the example that I gave earlier, if it was Zinio, you would put Zinio in 5.15, and then the number of uses in 5.16. And then since you reported three, you would click on this add group icon or add group <clears> link. And it's going to add another group saying, well, what's your second collection that you have here? And you would enter the because second one. Because you told one. that. that yeah, because you had three. You have more than one. And you would enter the name of the second one and the number of uses. And then add group again for the third group. If you mm -hmm. entered it in error, you just click on remove group. And then that would remove this group here. Mm -hmm. And I think there's built into this an edit check. I think we built an edit check into it so that if you've entered four repeating groups, and three up here, it'll, 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 it'll at the end, it'll say, hey, wait a minute, yeah. you know, yeah. you've got one extra one here. Did you want to change that to a four yeah. or, or omit one? So that's kind of the basic navigation. Mm -hmm. um, there is at the end for the certification. Let's see. Let's go back to library services. Okay. Will it not go to its so, yeah, finished this, entering uh, thing? I don't know. So like I said, this little question mark could be your friend. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Um, you know, well, what do I count for registered borrowers? This kind of gives you some guidance. You know, it's a library, you know, do I count everybody in the community or do I count people just li with just library cards? This clarifies it. It says, it's a library user who has applied for and received an identification number or card from the public library. You know, and it also mm -hmm. tells you that your files should have been purged within the last three years. Always want to update, get rid of, yeah, yeah make sure everything's up to date. Yeah. yeah. So that th that question mark is always helpful. Mm -hmm. um, um, someone does have a question. Lola has a question here, and she says she has a microphone. So, all right, uh, Lola, I've unmuted you. You should be able to 
Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi. Okay, hi guys. Hey, this is great. But I was wondering if at some point, Sam, you could go over and have either a workshop or a webinar on what actually goes into the different um, questions through there. Sure. Because when I uh, because I do compare um, the libraries in my area and stuff, so I can um, see the numbers and stuff. And I can when I go over them, I see there's some great differences in what's reported one library versus another. And so to me, we're not comparing. Um, the same things all the time. So I was just wondering, you know, if right. at some point that could happen. Is everybody really doing it correctly? Yeah, no. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, are we using the same, um, you know, just for instance, you know, other funding sources, you know, I can see a lot of them will come up with fines, fees and stuff. And then all of a sudden you see a couple of libraries that don't have that or they, you know, or are they just not reporting it or how do they justify what they're doing, I guess is my, um, some right. of my questions I see. Right. And we had a, we had that come up. I just did a um, workshop where we went through an entire survey at the Castle meeting for the Southeast Library Systems. And then there's another one scheduled um, through Denise Harders with the Central Plains Library System scheduled for December 18th in Holdridge. Um, but yeah, if you contact your system um, systems director, we can definitely set up um, training sessions where I would come out and we would actually go through an entire survey. Mm -hmm. and say here's what you report where and answer questions basically on each section of the survey and i'll give you an example of something that came up at the castle meeting um, was um, we were talking about interlibrary loan and somebody mentioned the book club kits that are checked out from the library commission and they said well can we count that as an interlibrary loan and i said yes you can mm -hmm. um, so if you check out a book club kit that has 20 books in it that's an, an interlibrary loan um, that you've received from the commission and that would be considered 20 books then? Yeah, if you checked out 20 books in, in, that were in the kit, that would be 20 interlibrary loans. That you'd okay. So yeah, in answer to your original question, yeah, um, you know, we can definitely come out. I'd definitely be willing to come out. We have ones, like I said, that I'm not sure what system you're in. I think it's Southeast. Southeast. Yeah, so we just yeah. did the castle meeting, but uh, you know, if you want to work through Scott, but, yeah, we should talk to Scott up, um, and see about set up another one of those up. someplace else. I'd definitely be willing to do that. Do you want to reach out to everybody? I can reach out to all the yeah. systems directors too, and and just as a follow up, because like they said because, we did, they did the castle one, which is you know, specific group mm -hmm. that came together, and then Denise has uh, Central Plains doing one um, for Central, but um. Yeah, we'll reach out to the other systems, um, both Southeast, Three Rivers, and even Western, and see if they want something done either in person or a remote thing like this as yeah, well. Yeah, we could do that too, um, where we go through an entire survey. This and, doesn't and have to just be in one hour quickie thing like this. We can do full on, here's, mm -hmm. we're going to demo everything, yeah. everyone log in, and we'll see how it all goes. Yeah. And that is helpful because, like you said, you know, on your accreditation application, if you're if you're yeah. counting something or not counting something and, and your peer libraries are counting it differently, um, that definitely That's going to skew the numbers and it's not going to be correct. Things, yeah. yeah. I want you guys to be able to be compared correctly <clears throat> um, to each other with all the same, like you said, Lilla, putting in the, using the same information as your criteria of what, what you put into whatever box mm -hmm. so that when you are compared, you're all thinking about and using the same. Not to mention yeah. everybody's on the same page with reporting things correctly too. Yeah. And, and, and there is a little bit of gray area sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so Sam will reach out to the other systems and we'll get something set up but, but, um, before, obviously, this one's due in February. <laughs> sure, yeah. Yeah, we have some time. Thanks. Thanks Thank you. Well. All right. Uh, does anybody else have any questions? Um, you have about anything, any questions, any comments about the survey you want to ask of Sam while he's here? We're a little after 11 o'clock, but that's okay. We go as long as is needed to get everything, all of our information out to you and answer any questions you may have now. Um, so type into your questions section there. And while we're waiting, I would also say that as, if you run across things as you're going through your survey and say, hey, you know, this question you know, why do you ask this question? Why do you ask this question? Is this mm -hmm. something that's really necessary? You know, if it's not mm -hmm. a purple one, it's the purple ones we have to ask because those are federal no required choice, questions. Yeah. But if it's a state question, you know, like that was one thing that was great for me at the council meeting was, you know, there may be things that are important for us to ask on a state level as we look at certain trends 
but maybe not important to you on the local level. But there are maybe other things that might have run their course and might not be as important to us on a state level. And so we might want to look at maybe not collecting that data anymore. And we want to make the survey as simple as possible. Mm-hmm. And maybe, you know, as, as painless as we can. <laughs> Everything is up for, for discussion. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, let me know or, or provide feedback. And also feedback on the new version of Bibliostat, too. Right. So this if is new this year. It's, it's, this is the it's first time we're and, doing this one. And I think there's four of us states that have jumped in and, and, and did the whole thing, oh. did the whole switch over. Um, so if you run into any issues, we want to make sure that we get those reported back to them. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have a good rep that's responsive to things that we suggest too. Yeah. So if there's, I've already suggested some things that I would like to see that show status bar up at the top left. I'd like to see that more prominent. Yeah, I, that's why I, when you were mentioning, I'm like, I don't uh, see it. That's yeah. why I was like, I wanted to point it out because it is so kind of hidden. Yeah, and so that was one of my suggestions Ish, for them so is to yeah. move that over and make it big next to the print icon. Um, and so I'm sure that we'll discuss that next week at our at our annual meeting. But um, so there's some things that I've suggested to them. But if you run across anything, pass that on to me. Um, and I'll make sure that I give it to them. Mm-hmm. Great. All right. Well, it doesn't look like anybody typed in any desperate questions they needed answered right now. That's okay. You guys know where to find where to find Sam. Reach out to him here at the commission. All right. So I think we'll wrap up today's show. Do you need to log out of this? Oh, to, yeah. yeah. Let's do that. All right. And yeah, leave that open. Yeah. All right. So I think we'll wrap it up for today. Thank you so much, Sam, for being You're here and talking about this. Thank I'm you. glad to get this information out. Um, it looks like we do need a little bit, you know, especially with the new interface, a bit more hands-on training. Um, and we'll, uh, you know, I put you on the spot there saying we'll reach out to the system. So but oh, we will. That's, yeah. That's Contact what, that's Scott for, and yeah. Eric and Jan, the other three, and see if uh, we can get something set up with their sure. area as well. Absolutely. It is over the winter time though, so that is, you know, as you mentioned, just your travels to next week, weather permitting doing these things. Mm-hmm. So um, possibly something in person, possibly something that becomes a remote thing like this, just because sure, of that we'll, kind of thing. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Yeah, we have options. All right, so that will wrap it up for today's show. Um, I'm gonna go to our Encompass Live website, which here from our library commission page, you can also search for Encompass Live. Um, oops if you want to, but also if you just use your search engine of choice. So far, um, Encompass Live is the only thing called that um, on the internet, and hopefully no one else will ever call it that, anything that, because we're, <laughs> we're the one, and you can get to us as well. Can we sue them? Um, hmm? Can we sue, sue somebody? Yeah, I, I need to trademark <laughs> or whatever I need to do for that, yeah. Uh, so this is where we have our upcoming sessions, but I want to show you, this is where our archives are here underneath, at, um, underneath all our upcoming shows. And this is all of our archives, the most recent ones at the top. So today's show will appear up there uh, probably by the end of the day today. I should have everything processed and as long as YouTube cooperates and everything and have it up there. Everybody who attended today and who registered will get an email from me letting you know when it's available. And you will have, this is similar to last week's, it'll be the same thing. You have a link to the recording on our YouTube and a link to the PowerPoint presentation that will post up to our SlideShare account will be there for you. Um, and while I'm here, I'll show you, you can search all of our archives. We have a search feature here now. We can search all sessions or just the most recent 12 months if you want something more up to date. Um, and that is because this is 2018, and we're almost wrapping it up because it's the end of the year, is the 10th year of Encompass Live. Yeah, I know, it's crazy. So if, and these archives here, if you go all the way to the bottom, close your eyes and scroll all the way down, we have all of our archives going back to the very beginning, 2009. So you will find things in here that are old, um, possibly out of date, definitely out of date. Links might not work. Services might not exist anymore. You never know. Um, But everything has a date on them, so you know exactly when it was broadcast live, so you can tell, oh, this is actually from back in 2012, so then might be this might be why now whatever it is doesn't exist anymore. Um, but you can limit your um, record uh, search to just the most recent year if you want to up there as well. Um, so that will be for our archives. Uh, so we also do have a Facebook page for Encompass Live. So if you're big on Facebook, give us a like over there. We post when our new shows are coming up. Here's a reminder to log in right now to today's sh- oops, to today's show. Uh, when our recordings are available, we post up here. No, I don't want to log in. Um, so um, if you like to use Facebook, you'll get notices from us over there. 
Um, so I hope you join us for next week when our topic is the best new teen books of 2018. Uh, this is Sally Snyder, who um, is our coordinator of children's and young adult library services here at the commission. This is her annual list. She does a teen one and a children's one, and they did the children's one earlier. Yeah, and this is the teen one, her best new teen books of 2018, along with Jill Annis, who is from our um, Elkhorn Grandview Middle School. She joins us for that one. So we talk about all the books, great new books that came out in 2018 for your teens. Um, and you can use that in conjunction with the best new children's books of 2018 was done two weeks ago. So you can watch that recording to see the there. Um, Sally did that one with um, other people because the children's teen. Uh, Dana Fontaine from Fremont High School and Carlo Wendelin, who's from, um, works with the Nebraska Golden Sower Awards program. So those are your two best new children's and teen book sessions that Sally does every year for you. So hopefully you'll join us for next week's show or any of our other ones we have coming up. I do have, um, other ones coming. We're getting our, our 2019 sessions already booked. And I'll just let so you know, um, the last one in December, December 26, will be an update to um, from our Talking Book and Braille service here at the Nebraska Library Commission. I'm just waiting for a uh, description, an official description from Scott Schultz, our director there. So just if you're looking for something about Talking Book and Braille, they've got some new things they're doing there that will be our December 26th session. So please do sign up for that. Other than that, thank you very much for attending. Thank you for being here, Sam. Thank and you. we'll see you uh, next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye.